We have one hour. Um, we're going to do our board discussion. Um, and the good news is it's a, it's a workshop with uh, Ling, and Ling talks really fast. <laughs> <laughs> Try to slow down. Yeah, so we'll start, we'll start with a, a round of introductions. I am uh, Commissioner Ronis Castillo, Ramsey County District 3. Dana Naki, Procurement Manager in Finance. Ling Becker, Workforce Solutions Director. Joanna Burke, Deputy County Manager. Ryan O'Connor, County Manager. Tony Carter, County Board, District 4. Mary Jo McGuire, County Commissioner, District 2. Uh, Nicole Frethen, County Commissioner, District 1. Victoria Reinhardt, County Commissioner, District 7. Shu McDonough, District 6. Leanne Ahmed, Health and Wellness. Rochelle Barsicella, Property Management. Channel Phelan, Workforce Solutions. Jared Duffy, County Manager's Office. Karen Francois, Deputy County Manager, Information Lee Perkins, CFO. Matt Bell, Commissioner Carter's Office. Mark McKay, Parks and Recreation. Ryan Reese, Parks and Recreation. Dmitri Collison, Planning. Jill Anderson, Policy and Planning. Awesome. Thank you for joining us today. I'm just going to kick it off right over to uh, Joanna Burke. And uh, I will just say briefly, this is follow-up to the uh, board workshop that we had in July. Um, we're moving to operationalize this work, and so we're kind of seeing this as a, as a close-out update on the project. And with that, Lynn. Yeah, thank you, commissioners, for your time this morning to give you an update. Um, uh, this work is aligned with our strategic priorities around um, uh, comprehensive economic development to build prosperity. Um, annually, Ramsey County invests millions of dollars in public infrastructure through capital projects. Um, the county also owns land and participates in economic development projects. And we want to just ensure that those investments are done with a lot of thought and um, diligence around ensuring that we're building community wealth within our communities, both around our small business inclusion and our workforce inclusion. So um, this work also supports the county's work around age racial equity. Um, we're very focused around our construction projects to want to support small women and minority owned businesses. And in addition, to ensure that we're creating um, career opportunities within construction for people of color within those, um, those contracts that we're, we're preparing. Please stop me if you need to. A lot of this, because we're coming back with an update, um, this is a little bit of a review, so. Yes. Just, I, I can't help but, but laugh a little bit. It's to sustain small women. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I was looking to say things. It goes maybe small women. Maybe a comma. Small women. It's just me. Yeah. I'm good with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we've made some progress in the last three years. Um, in 2017, we updated our county goals to reflect, you know, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights efforts around 32% minority labor hours and 20% women labor hours. Um, in 2018, the board. Um, as you, most of you will recall, you approved um, a position within Workforce Solutions um, to work on these efforts in addition to reinforcing these goals within our contracts. And then in 2019, um, around March of last year, we launched a, um, a new working <coughs> group to um, further accelerate this effort. And then we came to the board in July with a progress update. So the goal today is to um, kind of give you an update on the progress that we left behind in July. So um, I want to just highlight the team members that have been working on this project. Joanne has been our project sponsor. Um, we've had participation from various folks within our economic growth and community investment service team, in addition to our strategic team and also IPR. I want to especially call out the work of um, Dana from Procurement, really helping us understand so much of this work. I'm really glad that she's at the table with me today. And really calling out um, the work that Mi Cheng has done around um, helping us understand the data. The data has been very um, manual intensive. In addition, um, John O'Fallon's been our boots on the ground in terms of really doing um, a tremendous amount of community engagement um, since May. Uh, he personally has done 50 community engagement events out in the community, ensuring that folks understand how to do more business with Ramsey County, helping make connections, and it's really a, an important investment that you all made back last um, uh, in December of 2018. 
So there's really three opportunities when it comes to advancing inclusion around this work. Um, we talked about how to increase our contracting inclusion. We talked about how to ensure that we're um, improving our workforce inclusion, and then obviously our community engagement. So when we came to the board in July, we talked about these each in great detail. We're gonna be giving an update on each of these elements today for you. Um, so the key findings from the board workshop in July were that we identified there were um, significant challenges around data um, amongst our departments, um, particularly when it came to subcontractor data in order to be able to understand who we're doing business with and on the workforce, on the business inclusion side and on the workforce side as well, that who, we're, um, who our contractors are employing. And so that was an area of identification of a, an issue or an area where we could improve. Um, we also talked about areas where we should do some evaluation and attempt to make some improvements. I'll be giving some updates <coughs> today around modernization, also on um, insurance limits, and also on the idea of debundling, which is taking larger projects and breaking down, them down into smaller manageable chunks that could be contracted out individually instead of under a large contract. Um, and then we'll be also, um, last time, we also talked about how we're deepening our community engagement efforts. So right now I'm going to turn it um, over to Dana so she can give just a little bit of background on the CERT process. Thank you, Ling. Good morning, Commissioners. So we, we thought we would start by giving you a little bit of background about the CERT program as a reminder as to what it is and how it was developed. So real briefly, the CERT program was created in 2007-2008 and municipalities are under, under the Uniform Municipal Contracting Law, and that law gives us authority to use small businesses. The, the program was developed um, based on a disparity study that was done in 2007, and the creators of the program, the executive board, were the City of St. Paul, serving as our lead agency, Hennepin County, uh, City of Minneapolis, and Ramsey County. Now, some of you may have heard that the city of Minneapolis left in 2014, but they did rejoin the executive board in 2017-2018. So we're all back together again on the executive board. Um, the CERT program differs from other programs as we don't require personal asset identification. It's truly small business based on the federal small business administration size standards. So depending on what goods or services you sell, you might look, we might look at you qualifying as a small business based on your gross revenues for two to three years or how many employees you have. For our CERT program, you do have to have your principal place of business located in a 15 county local area. And you first certify as a small business. However, you can also then certify as a minority a women-owned or a minority woman-owned business. And the way to do that is to show that you have 51% ownership, which in this case means control of the company. Currently, we have over 1,600 vendors in the CERT directory, and it's growing rapidly. So I get to continue to speak to the veterans purchasing. Um, this is exciting. Last year we had a workshop with you on July 9th. And by, we heard you. <laughs> and by July 25th, we implemented administrative policy and procedure for veterans uh, procurement. So we have admin, uh, statutory authority under the Uniform Municipal Contracting Law first. And then we had administrative code authority for the administrative policy and procedure. Um, veterans need to be certified either by the federal government or the state of Minnesota. And we have modified our open data portal so that when we start seeing expenditures with veterans, it will, it will begin to be reported on the open data portal. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, and maybe we're getting to this. So if you're, if you're a member of the CERT program or the Veterans Program now, then you're eligible to apply for all of our, all of our work, right? Or is, and, and you have to be CERT, you have to be certified to be eligible for our work. Can you just go into that a little bit um, sure. more? 
Sure. So this is a this is a really uh, cool thing. We have statutory authority in under the Uniform Municipal Conduct in Law as a county to be able to to do, um, receive two quotes from a cert vendor or a veteran owned business. So it's not the full fledged competitive solicitation process. It's still a solicitation process, but we have authority from ten thousand now up to two hundred fifty thousand, so long as we receive two quotes. And that law was passed last year. Thank you, yes. Um, and that's my fault. I was looking forward. When you mentioned the statistic on <coughs> the CERT page, and I missed the statistic that you wrote forward. We have over 1,600 certified businesses. Uh, and as I look at you know, the fact that we are, we are really being very attentive and moving toward modernization and the ability to grab greater understand where we are and what we're doing with these businesses, not only the number, but how they are represented in our mix. Are we going to be guiding toward uh, regular identification of the work we're doing with SBEs and disaggregating that information by classification as well? We're going to be getting to that as the presentation okay. <laughs> so, all right. So the first area of opportunity is to increase our um, small <coughs> business spend, particularly not just those with a small business designation, but to focus specifically on minority and women-owned businesses. So we brought before the board this slide um, in July, where we aim to increase spend by five percent year over year um, within those departments that work on construction and design build contracts. The board expressed a desire to develop a more aggressive goal, and we are taking this year to develop that um, more aggressive approach. Uh, the steps in progress since July we've made take us a long way to be able to get us to further push ourselves, and so we're gonna um, revisit the action items and talk about kind of what we've done around each of those areas. So um, in the first uh, 1A and 1B action item, it really had to do with that um, that ability to understand our data uh, more clearly. And so, um, as I mentioned, the ability to capture that, sm that subcontractor level data has been arduous and definitely inconsistent within our departments. Uh, what is reported on Open Data Portal does not include subcontractor spend currently. Manual processes have been implemented in the interim so that we can track that, but it is a heavy lift. And as I called out Nhi Cheng for having done, kind of done some of that work for us, it is hard work. Um, we feel like we're, we're, we understand where the departments are at, but it's, it's not an easy thing to be able to get to that point. And so moving forward, um, we are um, in the process of purchasing new SBE tracking software that is currently tied with a project management solution process. I want to shout out Parks for being uh, leading us in this effort. And so once that is purchased, it will be available for all the departments that do construction. And it will help us to centralize and automate the SBE reporting, including all the subcontractors. And we anticipate the RFP will be released in sometime in February for that piece of it. Um, another area that we have heard oftentimes can be a barrier for small businesses, particularly women and minority-owned businesses, to do business with the county has to do with insurance limits. And so there are there is um, enterprise solutions being discussed right now at, govern, at governance team levels. And currently, um, construction projects are being evaluated contract by contract as to whether or not maybe limits could be reduced, uh, working with project managers on a case by case basis. Um, and then lastly, around the idea of debundling, um, we, as an EG CI um, service team, have identified um, three projects that we are going to debundle. And within that, we want to learn three things. Um, one is, by debundling, were we able to increase more scopes of service and bring new SBEs for contracting? And by hiring an SBE to be a prime, was there a change in the quality of work or the costs? And through this process, have some SBEs increase their contracting with us. So we're trying to take projects that have a mirrored opportunity and be able to kind of learn whether the bundling has made an impact. And we'll be able to know that um, further after those pilots. Yeah. Can you show me the three projects? Um, I have two of them in my notes here. I don't have a third one, I realized this morning. There is one um, in 
Public Works um, on creating um, uh, their ADA improvements projects um, was one of them. I can try to get more detail of um, notes here. Um, another one is, um, is in parks. They have a project around Ryan. Is it the ADA corrections? Yeah, ADA corrections at the parks projects. So we could send more details on those too if you have interest at least. And then I think we have a third one as well. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just not sure when to ask this question and I think you won't be surprised when I ask this question. But um, so I have a small minority woman owned business in my area. She just got appointed to our workforce solutions. So she's gonna be vocal and she continues to be vocal with me. Um, she's concerned about, um, you know, the, um, and, and I'm hoping the data will the data collecting will get at this. That you know, some minor, some women-owned businesses. You know, these are really men-owned businesses that put their name in their wife's. You know, in the wife's, mm -hmm. they put their company in the wife's name. So it's really a it's still a man-owned business. Um, and I don't. I know that's not always the case. But will this kind of recording get at that? And um, and then do we when we when we say we're we're doing cert as a you know the cert small business. Do we make sure that <coughs> it's not just women-owned businesses that we're giving it, that we really want minority-owned businesses? So that's the kind of thing that we're trying to get at by doing all this data disaggregation. disaggregation. Am, I, am I correct in that? Or? Yeah, I think getting to the level of understanding um, the fine-tuning of those subcontractors will really help. Mm -hmm. I think it will be a challenge to whether or not, you know, people can qualify as businesses with 51% control. I don't know how we would actually know what's happening know. behind those you know, know business know. doors to say yeah. who's yeah. actually controlling that business. And that's a, it's, it's, it's a valid, very valid concern. And I've talked to um, the, your, your uh, constituent in person about that, but it's a pretty hard one for the county to actually mm -hmm. be able to make a judgment on, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. More to add. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the question. As part of the lead agency's responsibility when they receive an application, they do look at um, the, def the definition of control of the company. And there are times where they do go and do an investigation to ensure that the principal place of location is in Ramsey County and not just a satellite office, mm -hmm. but also speak to the owner to understand if they truly um, are the controller of the, of the business or if it's just in their name. I'm just curious, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that piece because I understand, you know, but to have credibility in this, we have to be able to demonstrate that we are doing a really good faith effort here to sort that out because, you know, I worked in construction for 30 years. I've watched how this played out over the years and it's out there and it does us, doesn't do us a disservice if our only response is that, you know, we can't do much. It's much better if our response is this, that we actually do go out, we investigate, we talk to people so that people at least have some confidence that we take this seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all right. So what happens if you find out that, you know, I mean, on paper, it yeah. all looks legal, I mean, and, and fine. But what happens when you find out, because we know that they exist out there, we've all heard about it. The, um, the first qualification for CERT program is small business administration, regardless of ownership. Okay. So as long as they meet the small business certification, then they are certified as an SBE. If it's found that they're not certified as a minority or a woman owned, they will not get that certification, but they'll still be an SBE. We also have some con uh, connection with the state of Minnesota, so there have been times where the state denies, and then they will let us know, and then we look into it. Yeah, it just explain this a little bit farther because, you know, uh, and I'm glad to hear uh, later on you're talking about best value, but you know, mm -hmm. for years we've always just re had to rely on the smallest responsible bidder stuff, right? Which has not always been a pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. You know, and a few years ago, working with the county attorney's office, we actually started a process where we can de depower contractors when they're not following our process. And I think that was a big step for us to be able to actually start that. And I don't know what that looks like in this area here, right, where you have folks that are, you know, ended up being disqualified or any of that stuff about, you know, how does that align with the work that we've already been doing on this farm and here and, and ensuring the strong message to the community that, you know, we're serious about this, we're going to hold people accountable, and there are consequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Um, the next area is we wanted to, um, this was a slide from July as well, to work on increasing our workforce inclusion. And um, so we're going to go through kind of the action items again as to the progress that we had made. Um, we really wanted to improve our progress toward achieving 32% minority and 20% women um, around those projects. So um, for items 1 and B, uh, very similarly to the previous uh, work, we really need to get our heads around the data. So um, again, um, thankful for Parks for initiating a software purchase on behalf of the whole organization with a master contract. Um, input was received from all the other EGCI departments and an RFP will be released as well uh, fairly soon here. Um, with this implementation, the data will be at more accurate and fully include subcontractors and we'll have the opportunity to report that at Open Data Portal as well. Um, uh, regarding number two, um, we are currently adding language to all our solicitations that go out to vendors to ask them to go beyond just identifying their workforce goals to reach those minority and women employees, but we actually would like them to provide a detailed narrative as to how they're going to achieve those goals and work with the project managers through those plans. So, Commissioner Reinhardt. Going back to um, the RFP, and it says that Parks is initiating on behalf of the whole organization with input from other EGCI departments. Okay, is the whole organization all of Ramsey County? Or is it just ECGI? I think it would be something that the whole, the master contract would allow the whole organization to really use okay. the software. I just wanted to make sure because that's, we again don't want to be don't want yeah. four sides. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it means the whole organization. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner. Yeah, a couple things here on this one. So, number two is really the, the most mushy part of this. I appreciate you know, this narrative that you're asking for. Are we going to go as far as that we can actually make determinations about awardee contracts based on their response about how they're actually going to plan to meet this? Because in the end, you know, I really made a good faith effort, but I just couldn't do it. Yeah, you're asking a really good question. It's one that many entities struggle with because good faith effort means a lot, right? There's a whole compliance component to that, and there's an understanding of where the vendor is in the marketplace. We've not had those discussions yet. Um, what we're doing is we're trying to learn more from the vendors what programs they have in place in terms of mentorship or apprenticeship to see uh, what detailing out what they're doing in the marketplace with, with their people. Um, we are going to have, and we'll talk about it more in best value, but we are going to have a process by which we, we will look at their, um, their, them from a, a point of view of responsibility and responsible and what they've done in the past. Was, uh, I, I got another question in the very obvious, but just a kind of an observation. So, you know, we had Mortensen on our Union Depot project, right? And I've been able to watch and be Mortensen interact with them in the numerous areas. I've spoken to them at their annual event. Um, I task a greater MSP, right? Mortensen really just expects that every single one of their contractors is going to meet this requirement, and they've just done an amazing job in their community as a major general contractor. But they just they just get past this mushiness by just saying no, we're just gonna this is gonna happen and we're gonna get the best. We only want to deal with only partners that are gonna make this happen. And so the stronger that message is, well, you know, we understand that the market's ups and downs, mm -hmm. there's supply and demand and all that, but the more it's about, you know, there's just no ifs or buts. This is you know gonna happen. The other thing I wanted to raise, and I think I raised it at the last one, is you know, this effort here of us starting to make the connection to folks who are serving in our county to be able to participate and be a part of this inclusion, right? You know, our AMPET families and individuals there, you know, folks that are maybe in our chemical dependency or with the whole programs that already have a history in construction, but because of chemical dependency, mental health issues, you know, and with, so, with the support that we're already working with them in this, and, starting to tie some of these investments to folks that we are already got in our system on this other side and bringing them in with this opportunity i think is something that would be really helpful for us um so that we're not just kind of working in this silo over here we're doing all this good work in the community here but we continue to have all these people coming to go over here and we get them so far but we don't actually get them to that next point 
Commissioner Carter had a question. Oh, okay. It, it really is just on this point as I hear you, Dana, talking about the responsible, the fact that we are moving toward the ability to assess um, bidders based on their responsibility, you know, the language around responsiveness, you know, which I think you also use, may be different than the language around responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if we're working through that at this point in time so that we can be able to describe the kind of responsiveness that we're looking for and then uh, tend toward those who have been able to demonstrate that responsiveness. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question, and you're, you're correct. Obviously, there are two different definitions for responsiveness and responsibility. Responsiveness speaks to what they've submitted as, as a part of the proposal that demonstrates their ability to meet the needs of Ramsey County in the way that we adjusted the requirements, and we'll talk more about that at best value. Responsible means there's a definition under state statutes that talks about a vendor being responsible in construction. And so when we look at responsible, we need to be in compliance with that statute in terms of definition of responsible. And both of those will be a part of our go-forward discussions as we start to talk more about best value. And it will be interesting to understand how we tie what they've submitted at their plan to what they do as a result of their activity in that construction project. I'll look forward to hearing more about it. Thank you. Yeah, and in response to Commissioner McDonough's uh, previous thought about connecting some of those county um, systems that where people are, where we could be benefic benefiting our residents, um, you know, uh, several of the departments have been looking at efforts, especially around um, ensuring our corrections um, departments could be um, getting a career pathway into yeah. construction while they're still involved either in probation or <coughs> they're involved in the corrections facility. Um, yesterday actually was at the correctional facility and we've now launched a kind of a workforce solutions corrections action task force group that's going to meet regularly that didn't exist before where we're kind of finding gaps. Um, I recently did meet with somebody with one of our unions who actually wanted to get our MVIP um, young adult women exposed to um, even a real short-term training like a HAZWAP or it's like a two-week type training. Um, so we're, we're definitely having those kind of conversations yeah. right now. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, I, I appreciate that and then, you know, even take it a little bit farther, you know, kind of, we get a response of, you know, what, we, we, good faith effort, we just can't do it. Mm -hmm. And our response can be, well, you know what, we got five folks right. over here that we can feed you and help you meet your goal yeah. and we need you to <laughs> take them on this project, right? Okay. So the third pillar of the work is the community engagement. And I, I've, as I've said, you know, you've invested in a position. John's been doing a lot of work in this area, and we continue to leverage his role. But I wanted to kind of revisit these action items that we had brought to you um, back in July. So um, we've done a lot of outreach training and um, supporting special de uh, department projects across EGCI with John's role. Um, in addition, we've also created kind of a community engagement work plan that actually involves components in each of those departments. So for example, prior to some of the different project managers who might um, be on the cups of just starting a project, they will bring John in and have him kind of consult with, you know, who do you know in the community? What do, you, what, are, what do we know people are doing? What businesses are out there? He's done a lot of work with Dana on digging into the CERT database to figure out what are those categories of businesses that we need to ensure that we're trying to help grow and promote within our community because as much as we might have a desire to work with those businesses, those businesses have to exist and we have to know of them. And so there's a lot of pieces to that community engagement part that's key to that. Um, in addition, as you um, saw the, the economic development portal that um, Carrie um, and her department have worked on late last year unveiling, um, the second component of that is to ensure that we do include that economic, that inclusive economic development element, which has the workforce piece. So um, that is going to be a big part of um, my plate this next year, is to make sure that we integrate some of the existing technologies. We have a few construction job boards. We have some um, kind of a general job board, but they're not aligned in a, in a really strategic way, and we need to make it one stop, kind of, with our new portal and that investment there. So you'll be seeing that further later this year. <laughs> Um, here are a few pictures of some of the community engagement that have been happening. These are things that, you know, weren't happening um, before July, you know, where we are out as um, departments, uh, you know, property management and parks, both at an event at the U where we're connecting with 
um, you know, small business and minority business owners, you know, we're having at construction hiring events as Ramsey County. And then that top picture is a, uh, I'm going to talk about this in a few, next slide, but it's a leadership series for internal project managers and engineers to gain expertise and understanding how to improve ourselves in these areas. So I really appreciate this. So this is more than just like helping uh, these small businesses um, become cert, you know, certified. It's really about how do they actually get work in Ramsey County and how do we train our own people to give them work because it's really frustrating when they do all the things they used to be able to do and they're still not getting any work. Absolutely. So that's the goal. Of the, I just want to affirm that that is the goal here. Yeah, and I think under that comprehensive economic inclusive strategy, you know, Carrie and I work a lot on, you know, how do we get this open to business resource connected with these folks that are trying to, you know, either start, grow, or expand their business in Ramsey County, right? We need to connect all these resources so that we're looking at them kind of comprehensively, and I think that's a new thing that we're just, you know, able to kind of get a good cadence on how to do. So, um, so some new initiatives underway. Um, I'll let Dana talk about best value first, and then I'll talk about the others. Thank you, Lincoln. Okay, I've been really reserved up to this point, but now I'm going to get really excited. Uh, okay, so um, let me talk a little bit about how we do solicitations in Ramsey County for construction. As you all know, probably by now, we do a bid. And bid is the lowest bid wins. Statutorily, that's how it works. Under the, under the Uniform Municipal Contracting Law. So, under the Uniform Municipal Contracting Law, we also have the opportunity to do what's called best value, and sometimes best value is misused. Um, it pertains to us only to construction. And so the best value process is different because we can do an RFP, a request for proposals. Now, in the law, it's very interesting, very rarely in our Uniform Municipal Contracting Law do they reference back a, a state statute in Chapter 16, which is state procurement, but in this case, they do. And so we have to be in compliance with Chapter 16 best value definition, of which they explain the process, explain the factors, explain evaluation. There's also a requirement that if an agency wants to do best value for construction, they must be trained. So, last December, I'm excited to tell you that Hennepin County offered training. Ramsey County, nine of us went and took the training. Um, ref we were representing um, all, like all EGC, EGCI, I think, as well as my procurement staff and, my, and myself. Um, we were there with other cities as well, so we're not the only ones starting to try to go in this direction. Um, and so we came back in January and shared this concept with our Purchasing and Contracting Action Team Corps and received a go-ahead to bring it forward to the Purchasing and Contracting Governance Team, which we'll do in February. And if the concept is a, a thumbs up go, we're looking to develop a work team. And the work team will be across these organizations as well. It will take us a little bit longer than the veterans program because <laughs> there's a lot of um, definitions we'll need to look at. We'll put a, together an administrative policy and a process for using best value as another tool, an additional tool in Ramsey County for construction. That's great, Commissioner McDonough. Um, There's really good news. What, uh, I don't know how far we can go on finding best value, what that means to us, and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. connecting it back to our mission, vision, and goals, and values. I think would be really important. I don't know the, what the law allows, but I want to go back to your lead-in because, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not just lowest bid, it's lowest responsible bid. Yeah, lowest responsive, okay, so responsible. Can we talk about responsible? Because there is, that's where the avenue of disbarment and stuff comes from. <coughs> you guys recall, and you probably do, we had a contractor to redo all our park shelters at Keller, right? Mm -hmm. it was supposed to be like an eight month project and it took two years mm -hmm. and they were sitting, it was just a miserable, miserable thing. And in the end, they weren't responsible, but you know, I mean, so I think I'm really excited about the best value, but you know, again, focusing in on what we are having to do the lowest responsible bidder. 
and what responsible means. And I, think I shared this story with you before, but I, you know, I used to work for another government agency as a construction worker, and we used to have issues with contractors that would do it. I can remember having a conversation with the facilities manager about this lowest responsible bidder, and you know, his response at the time was, you know, you know, I gave him this example. You know, well, what happens if they put the valve in wrong and it causes a bunch of damage? His response was, I don't care if they put the valve in wrong a hundred times. My definition of a responsible bidder is, is every time we ask them to change the valve, they do. And I disagreed with him. I said, no, I think, you know, a responsible <laughs> bidder, you, know, you can maybe put one in, yeah. but after one or two, you, you lose the ability to say you're a responsible contractor because you're supposed to be providing trade and qualified people to not put valves in backwards to cause other damage. So excited. I really appreciate the best value, but let's not forget our tool of responsible, lowest responsible, better than a tool in making sure that we're as tight as possible on this spot. Yes, and lowest responsive, responsible, better. Mm -hmm. All of that coming together with best value and the fact that our team has been trained now and is moving toward what will be, I'm sure, a careful plan for implementation. Um, Commissioner McDonough just mentioned this. We're working to describe that, and I wanted to say, so how do we describe that? As we're working to describe that, it's really important to tie back to our vision and mission goals. And also, I would think that this could be an area within which we'd want to be careful to have some level of community engagement. Uh, as we work through this. Just wanted to check in with you to ensure that that would be <coughs> within the plan and as we're starting with what we're trying to achieve and making certain that we're bringing folks along with us, um, I would hope that we have a plan for community engagement. All right, and then I'll just briefly talk about a few of these other new initiatives. Um, you know, I think it's, Oftentimes, you know, we're, we have these kind of big overarching conversations and, and policies and that type of thing, but it really gets down to the people who know each other in these networks, right? And so being able to build networks for people is quite a bit of the value, I think, of the work that we can try to engage in. And so the first initiative is really around creating a small business series for businesses that um, might be throwing their hands up and going, I don't know where to start, I don't know where, where to connect to, and to help them get networked. And so John will be leading that work for us um, through our department, but really around you know a several times a year initiative where any of you could refer businesses to take part in a series that could learn things like how to do business with Ramsey County, you know, how does the procurement contracting work, um, how does, you know, the legal and public policy aspects, like how do I get on the CERT database, how, you know, because we're learning that these things are not that easy, like people who are, who are just starting a business, trying to get financing, wearing many hats, you know, getting as many resources of people who can support them within the county when there's not an active proposal that they're trying to go for, you know, we can help them in a very, you know, kind of a, 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 a way that is much more collaborative, right, in that space. So so that's, that's something that we're excited about. Um, as, as I showed you in that uh, slide with the picture, we have created kind of a, a workforce equity leadership program where county employees can come and hear from different uh, resources about how to push ourselves in areas of, of work. Um, Dana will be presenting to the group. We've had the Minnesota Construction Foundation come present to the group. So a lot of the resources could be internal or external, but that there's there's resources and we're trying to beef up our even own professional development per se around around the terminologies and kind of the resources and the networking, right? Because a lot of times you end up being in these meetings and you might meet another person running a different project in a different department and they tell you something that they did that was really helpful. So I think it's spurring those conversations. On a, on a staff level is really, really important. Um, we're also, um, there's a lot of great nonprofits, especially ones that we work with in Workforce Solutions that do construction pathway programs. We're really trying to encourage our EGCI departments to consider those programs, especially on contracting projects that are under $10,000 um, to work with those programs and to help uplift those, um, those training partners. Yeah, Commissioner Reinhardt. So where are we at as far as success with that? We are just starting like that kind of introductory process. Parks has gone out and met with a, a couple nonprofits. They have a, a sugar shack project that they're hoping to um, work on with a, one of our construction partners right now that they're in the process of working on. So, 
So, kind of sure. so um, similar on similar track um, with the workforce equity leadership program. Is that a is that going to be something that people are going to be required to go to, or is that just for people that want to know about it? Because I, you know, we all know that the people that are more inclined to do it anyway are going to be the ones that might have signed up for this, and the people that maybe most need it mm -hmm. don't actually go. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious mm -hmm. how we're really encouraging, maybe more than encouraging, yeah. our employees to be a part of that. And then the, um, the same with the small contracting projects. Like if we're just encouraging them, nice, but are we requiring them to have at least two a year or something? I mean, I'm just mm -hmm. curious what our benchmarks are going to be for some of these because encouragement is great. Mm -hmm. But it's that's what it is. So I'm hoping we have a little more stronger, yeah. Those stronger are nice. language that we're stronger encouragement than um, just. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll just no. I appreciate yeah. the question, Commissioner. Yeah. I, I just will share a couple of thoughts. I mean, I I think um, I mean one of the pieces I try to balance from where I sit with this work mm -hmm. is um, there's a way to encourage passively and a way to encourage in a proactive mm -hmm. way about. Um, appealing to both the organizational goals as well as individual advancement, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people often come forward and say, I'm frustrated, I can't find my path forward in this organization mm -hmm. and stuff. And so the, um, the mandating approach has pros and cons as well. Yeah. And I'm not saying that it's all black and white on any of this. I mean, there are times when you gotta think about that very clearly and, mm -hmm. um, but to use that judiciously while making encouragement be one of those pieces where it's clear but we're gonna to continue to show up and report on what's going on. And you don't want your department to be a laggard and you wanna be seen as a leader in this organization. There are a lot of ways to demonstrate commitment through encouragement and so I hear you and I just wanna let yeah. you know what I think we need to mean by encouragement. <coughs> and if that doesn't work, then we need to go farther than that. And I, and I really appreciate that, so thank you for, for that. I appreciate all that, but the best way to get participation is word of mouth about that was valuable to mm -hmm. me. Good point. Right. And to right. make sure that would when the when the willing people are going, then the yeah. feedback they bring back is, boy, that was really valuable. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's the best true. way to and that is. that. Yeah, and I think that's a, a nice little yeah. segue around just the next steps of this project is really that the work the work team that we've had, this effort is going to kind of transition into our service team procurement contracting action team. And so those conversations and that accountability, mm -hmm. I think, will be held up in that space amongst the department directors and the folks that are um, working on those efforts. So I don't know why it's called. Okay. Um, I do want to just reference our Young Adult Public Sector Career Academy um, as just a final little new initiative that I think makes a difference. And why I think it does is um, last week we had, I'm excited to bring them actually to the board on February 25th. We have six um, diverse young people of Ramsey County who are rotating right now through our EGC departments. And why this ties into this project, I think, is that not only are they learning a little bit about Ramsey County government, but, but they're starting to build their network. They're, tr they're starting to see what are the roles and things that the, these different EGCI departments are doing. They're in our libraries right now, they're in our parks, they're in property management, and they're in public works. And they might be the ones that go to the next phase of our young adult program, which has entrepreneurialism, and they will open a business that could support one of our departments someday. So I feel like the more people that get lenses and opportunities to get inside our work, we are actually creating that ecosystem for really developing that. And so that's a pilot project right now, but our dream would be to take that across the county where every service team is having a rotation like that going forward. Um, and it's, it really aligns with our federal funding as well, so there's a lot of opportunity there. So um, with that, I think we're gonna take questions. Yeah. I just wanted to add a, a personal plug for the Young Adult Public Sector Career Academy. I have a constituent in my district who went through it and it's, just sings the praises of it all the time. And he's uh, a remarkable young man, so I think it's a great opportunity for him, and I'm so glad he got to be a part of it, and I'm glad that he is now continuing to work with Ramsey County. Mm -hmm. And just to thank you and everyone here for all of their work on this. This is really, really great to hear, and I'm just gonna you know, say, yes, let's, let's support whatever you, you need to do to make this happen. And just to thank you um, personally, Ling, for, for actually taking a very vocal person who is a minority, small owned, women owned business in my district and putting her on the Workforce Solutions Board. Yeah. So you know, she can really be vocal there and, and really help us see, see what that is. So it was a brilliant move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she really you know, wants to do work with Ramsey County and we're gonna figure out a way to help her and others. I mean, just to, she can be a voice for that. Yeah. And that was a good, 
a good thing to do because yeah. you know that's what our goal is here. Yeah, thank you for you know introducing her. She's very um, she's located in Roseville with a engineering and constru uh, uh, construction firm, but really um, passionate woman who actually yeah. has served on the U of M Board of Regents. Yeah. So extremely qualified, but she's currently also going to be serving on our uh, youth committee as well. Yeah. So really thinking about kind of how her voice can help us shape the future of our workforce efforts. Yeah. So and thank her, you. And her name is Yan Kim, and yeah. we disappointed her. I mean, we just like, affirmed it, and yeah. she is amazing. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Just uh, two final thoughts from my end, Madam Chair. You know, part of today was because this has been such important work for the board, we really want to do an update on where we've been on the work specifically. It wasn't about trying to introduce more or new things today, but to show it's easy to put up what the work plan looks mm -hmm. like, and then if you don't check back in on it, um, that can be challenging. And even getting to go through a gender review was a chance for me to spend an hour checking in on it, really testing out some of this too. And so it's it's good to do. I, as we think about. Um, the service team led discussions around strategic alignment with where we're trying to go. This is actually one of those topics that I think is going to fit really well into some of those conversations. And so if you think about what's the venue where this is going to continue to come forward, it's still going to come back to this body. I think the venue is going to be less as a standalone topic and more integrated into some of our other work in conversation with the board. That would just be a piece of reaction. And finally, uh, Commissioner Reinhardt asked it earlier. I thought it might come up a few more times, so I wanted to end on it. You know why EGCI gets highlighted so much in this could come up a lot. Part of it's because they haven't had the same opportunity to lead on some of the other work happening. This has been one of those great opportunities for that, that service team to really get an opportunity to step on the gas. Um, on the nonprofit side of the spend and diversification of spend and how we're doing measurement, you're going to see health and wellness have a larger role just because a huge share of their spend falls in a different category of organizational <coughs> entity, right? Um, but it's been, it's been really neat to see EGCI out in front on issues that involve you know, race and equity and inclusion and gender and um, allow them to put a foot forward and move the organization forward. They're not doing it in a vacuum, but it is a chance where they have collectively come in with Joanna and said like, hey, we want to hit the gas pedal, will you let us lead? And um, I think sometimes the best thing we can just do is say yes to that and, and then stay aligned. And I think you're seeing that in action. So I just want to call that out and thank Ling, but all the other departments as a part of this as well, and Joanna for her leadership to take that on. Yeah. So I'll just add to that, closing out, I just want to thank you and acknowledge your energy and excitement for contracting. Really, <laughs> I feel like we blew past that, and I, I just want to acknowledge so that. I toned it down a lot. I, no, it's really, it's really remarkable because it's an area that most of us never think of, but we it's get so frustrated by right. doing yes. it well. Absolutely. And so knowing how your yeah. passion behind it and doing it, and how quickly you respond to what we say, what about, and like the veterans, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. All done. And now we'll take a shift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.